Let me tell you a story about, uh, not the story you think you're going to hear, a story about a summer night in 2007. I was a brand new co-pilot, and I was sitting on alert with a rescue crew in Kandahar, Afghanistan, playing Halo at, you know, two in the morning or something like that with my crew, and laughing and joking, and all of a sudden, all of our radios start going off, and all the maintenance guys jump up, and everyone's galvanized into action, and all of a sudden, we're all business. We've got a rescue to go on. While it's exciting, it's also sobering, because what that means is someone else is having a really bad day. So we're spun up into action. We become very serious all of a sudden. We're you know, jumping into our gear and running out to the aircraft, and, and there's a little bit of ribbing going on to try to add some levity to the situation. You never know what you're going into at that situation. And then we start to get the details of the mission over the radio as we're, we're spinning up. The engines start to, to wind up, the, the rotors start to spin, and you can kind of feel the palpable energy of the crew pulsing with the rotor blades, and, and we're all just kind of getting spun up and ready to do something that we've done hundreds of times. And the details start coming over the radio. We're going into a village that is known to be hostile, that is known to be harboring Taliban insurgents. We're going in to save the life of a child, a three-year-old child walked in on his father building a bomb, and he breathed in the chemicals and got chemical burns inside of his lungs. So not only are we going to save a life that we all obviously would put our lives on the line for, but it's also clearly a very hostile area. We launch with two Apaches, which is not standard for us, which kind of um, added an extra element of sobering to the crew because that means that somebody has identified that this is really not a good place for us to be. And uh, we truck on. We're trying to win the hearts and minds. So even though it's a village that's not necessarily friendly to us, we obviously value civilian lives and, and we're there to save lives. We come in on night vision goggles in very dusty conditions and we, we execute a night vision brownout landing, which is actually a lot more dangerous than any of the enemy fire we could be receiving. And uh, as soon as we land, we're, we're in all business mode, and we're, I'm, I'm running checklists, and my hands are moving, and I, I, I catch some motion kind of in my peripheral on my night vision goggles, and I, and I look up, and I alert the crew to what I'm looking at, and there's silence in the cockpit, which usually there's not silence uh, on the radios. We're always doing something, preparing for something, and there's silence in the cockpit as we all look and see a mob starting to form at the center of the village. I get on the radio and break the silence and talk to the Apaches above us and tell them what we're seeing, and they confirm that that's what they're seeing as well. The mob starts to get bigger, people are looking at us, they're pointing at us, we never know if it's an enemy combatant group that's going to stage an attack on us. Um, downing an American helicopter is obviously a big feather in, in, in their cap. Um, or if they're just curious, because a lot of people in that part of the world haven't even seen a car, let alone a helicopter. The mob starts moving toward us, they start gaining momentum, they start going faster and faster, they're running downhill toward us now. It, it's, it's about the worst possible scenario, because we're there to save someone's life, we don't want to hurt anybody, we don't want to be hurt ourselves, we have this drive to survive and to, to protect the people that we're serving with, and we don't have the three-year-old little boy loaded onto our aircraft yet, so we can't pull pitch and, and leave. Right about then, one of the Apaches buzzes the crowd at about 10 feet, and you can almost hear the cartoon brakes <laughs> get put on as the entire crowd stops. And if they were curious, then they know that that's a safe distance that they can watch us. And if they had hostile intent, that maybe they should think twice about what they're about to do. Um, at night, maybe they didn't even realize we had these Apaches with us. So we kind of enter into this tense stare down of us watching them and them watching us, and we're trying to get the the kid loaded on so we can take him to the hospital, and uh, we take off uneventfully and get back to Kandahar and kind of look at each other on the way home like, what just happened? <laughs> we're thanking the guys and the, the, the Apaches on the radio. We'll never, never meet those guys because they're Army, we're Air Force. We're going to go off and debrief separately. Um, there's, there's a guy somewhere who saved my life who I will never get to shake hands with, or a girl. That mission is an example of a culmination of my following my heart my whole life. My recognizing what stirred my passion was serving my country, was flying, was having the opportunity to do so in combat. And it probably comes as no surprise to you guys that there were a lot of people along the way who tried to deter me from this path. Either well-intentioned people trying to protect me, 
or people who underestimated me and didn't think that I could succeed at it and wanted to see me happy, or found strong women threatening or didn't think women should be in combat. When I came home from my last tour and engaged the Pentagon in the fight for women's rights, uh, the fight for women to have the right to apply for any position, not the right to be appointed to any position, but the right to compete for these positions, a lot of people also tried to demonize my dreams and my following my heart by saying, how dare you fight for the right to go to war? You know, are you a warmonger? Do you want to hurt people? Do you want to be part of this war machine? It doesn't matter what your politics are. It doesn't matter what your thoughts are about someone's capabilities. No one has the right to tell someone else that their dream is wrong. And I'm hoping, <laughs> thank you. One of the reasons I engaged in the lawsuit, it's so funny, when people try to stop you from doing something, how, they have no idea how much they help you sometimes, <laughs> right? When my oldest stepdaughter came to me the day before that I got the phone call from the ACLU to take part in the lawsuit, and she said, I really wanted to be a Marine, and you didn't tell me I couldn't do that. Why didn't you tell me that? And I said, I would never tell you that. What, why do you think you can't do that? Because that's a boy's job. She had been told that by an adult in her life, an adult. And the ACLU called me the next day and said, would you like to? And I said, yep. And I said, no, 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 let me finish. And I said, OK, go ahead. Would you like to? Yep. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, it could be you know, really hard. You're going to face a lot of And I was like, I don't care. Sign me up. Count me in. Because uh, I don't want my 12-year-old, now 13-year-old stepdaughter to face that as she's growing up. I challenge you guys to do a couple of hard things. First is identify what it is that stirs that passion in your soul. What is it that ignites you and galvanizes you? And, and follow that with every bit of vigor in your soul. I would also challenge you to flick away the barriers and the negative people and the people who tell you that you can't do that to include your fear of failure. When I mentor people or, or people come and ask me for advice or I, I go and give speeches and then I engage them in Q&A, invariably the unhappiest people I talk to are the people who can identify what stirs their spirit, but their fear of failure keeps them from even trying. There's you know, anecdotal stories about Babe Ruth and how many times he was struck out, and it's just so true. I, I, I failed so many times. I got the door shut in my face so many times. And yet, there I was on that night, there to rescue that three-year-old little boy. I challenge you to dismiss failure because success is not satisfaction. My hope for everyone in this room is that when you take your last breath, you look back on your life and you're fulfilled and satisfied that you followed your heart with every last bit of energy that you had, the result of which not really mattering that much. I went and visited that three-year-old little boy every day after that rescue, and I watched him get better and better. And it was a real satisfying thing to watch. And on the third day, I went back to visit him, and he wasn't there anymore. And I was so happy that he got to go back to his family, and maybe his dad would think differently about us. And, and, uh, and one of the nurses that recognized me as somebody who had been visiting him flagged me down and said, I'm so sorry. His, uh, his injuries led to pneumonia, and he succumbed and, and passed away. The most terrifying moment in the story is not the mob running down the street. It's waking up the next morning and putting my life on the line and putting the lives of my brothers and sisters on the line and with no guarantee of success. No guarantee that, you know, 12 Americans could get killed and we still didn't save someone. That's the most terrifying thing, but you know what? The people that I did save wouldn't be here if I had let that terror and that fear of failure dictate me following my heart. Following your heart doesn't mean being stubborn and sticking to something either. Sometimes it changes. Um, I've fought the Taliban, I have fought the Pentagon, and I have most recently embarked on my most terrifying adventure. I fell in love and had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> 
absolutely terrifying. Everything that I see is something that could kill my child. <laughs> but I'll tell you, satisfying, yes, you know, and, and my fears and my hopes for him and how he's going to grow up, just satisfying to know that I went out there and gave my all. So I challenge you to find that thing that inspires you. Inspiration is everywhere. You know, I recently was talking to a, a friend of mine about a, an amazing event that he had just been a part of, and I said, oh, God, how did, you, how did you gear up for that? How did you get through that? And he looked at me and he said, fate rarely calls upon us at the moment of our choosing. And I was like, wow, who said that? And he said, Optimus Prime. <laughs> Inspiration is everywhere. <laughs> it's in children's cartoons, which I love seeing that type of language in children's cartoons. <laughs> at TED Talks, at lunch tables, sitting around and meeting new friends and finding inspiration there. I challenge you every day, revisit that place that stirs in your heart and your spirit. Find that inspiration, remove the barriers, follow your heart, don't let other people dictate to you what your dreams mean and get out there and change the world. Thank you so much.